Hi everyone. Welcome to Canadian Business History Association speaking uh, speaker series. And today we are here for a real delight. I assume everyone can hear me. Can you give me a thumbs up? Awesome. Great. I'm Sanjeev Sharma. Uh, before the excitement of occasion takes, takes over my thinking, let me introduce myself. I'm a business history enthusiast, not as much as Joe Martin, who is our president of the Canadian History Association, but quite close. And more importantly for this group, I am the new treasurer. So let me explain why today is a momentous occasion for Canadian Business History Association and for personally for me. And thank you, Tabitha, for organizing this and making this happen. First, we always think history in past tense and reflect on changes. But today we are going to talk about a topic, which is we are seeing history in making. So this topic of artificial intelligence and emergence and change is we are living and breathing in this moment. So it's great to see that. Second, both as a Canadian and a Rotman alumni, it is an honor for me to welcome Professor Avi, Rotman Chair in Artificial Intelligence and Healthcare, and an author of two best-selling books on this topic of intersection of artificial intelligence with economics, power and production, and production machine. Avi has a front row seat in seeing this emergence of AI in business and, uh, and economy, and I'm extremely delighted that here we are uh, today he is here with us. So I'm honored to introduce Avi to this group. Finally, it's a topic which connects the two favorite topics of mine, history and artificial intelligence. History, my passion, artificial intelligence relates to what I do for my work in a way. So, and before we get to Avi, the best part of the session, let me just say how I see history of AI. Though we are seeing history in making, but as a student of history, as a student of mathematics and student of computer, I have always looked AI as a continuation of three elements. And Avi, uh, excuse me if I'm getting this wrong, but I see as three building blocks. One is in 1930s, right around the Second World War or, or around that time, Alan Turing's Turing machine, which in simple terms helped computation on real numbers, simple, scalable, and possible in a simple way that it can be programmed. Like I would say the, the practical origin of programming. That's number one, block number one. Block number two, what I call is logic theorist, where a group of theorists came together and started representing the, the physical objects like map in mathematical terms, mathematical forms. They started to give mathematical language to physical forms. That's what I call as the logic theorist. That's what Howard calls us as a group of logic theorists. And finally, what we hear chat GPT when, when people say about they're finding the best romantic poems using chat GPT or the best thing, everything chat GPT, its origin lies in some of the work that is led by Jeffrey Hinton, a British Canadian, who is the root of machine learning and le learning algorithm. And I'm sure Professor Avi will touch upon this a little bit. So today, what we see and what we hear is continuation of these three building blocks started the programming, making the physical space connect to mathematics, and finally get, getting this human concept of learning to a new and better name of tool, and that is artificial intelligence. And that's how I see artificial intelligence. And with that, I will hand over the mic to Professor Avi. Professor Avi, welcome to the group, and we are excited to have you here. Over to you. Okay, fantastic. Um... Thanks for, thanks for inviting me and looking forward to talking about artificial intelligence. I'm just going to share my screen. Um, it was fun preparing this talk because I, uh, um, you know, I, I get a lot of uh, discussions on AI to various groups, but I don't get to uh, dig into the history as much as, as I hope to today. So not so much the history of AI, but let's actually start with the history of how uh, Jay Joshua and I uh, got our interest in AI. So uh, we are professors at the University of Toronto. And let me be clear, there's going to be more history than this. Um, and uh, somewhere between 30 and 40 years ago, um, the University uh, U of T hired a guy in the comp sci department named Jeff Hinton. 
And uh, Hinton was working on trying to create algorithms that mimicked the way we understood the brain to work in the 1980s. Um, and he had some success in developing those algorithms. And as is often when people are doing uh, deep technology and deep science in university, no one cared. Okay. Uh, the 1990s came along, Hinton started working with some doctoral students some postdocs. Um, there were some young professors uh, coming through U of T in the comp sci department in particular, who were also working on um, on his, his models of neural nets. And men of the 90s, it was the boom of the internet. No one cared. Uh, first decade of the 2000s came along. Some advances in machine learning were uh, were improved, like were happening around the world. Uh, there were some real um, exciting developments at Stanford, at Berkeley, uh, at MIT, and elsewhere. Um, and uh, Hinton continued to work on his neural nets, and so did uh, some of his students. And they found some some you know specific applications in like um, uh, reading the what people wrote on on envelopes of letters in the post office and things like that, but it was not a fundamentally transformative technology to the point by where by the end of the first decade of this century, uh, the leading machine learning programs in the world at Stanford and MIT and others were saying, well, maybe we don't even need to teach neural nets. They just don't seem to work that well. Then in 2012, the world changed. In 2012, Hinton and a team of his students won a machine learning competition for labeling images called the ImageNet competition. And this competition had been going on for a while and um the machines were pretty awful compared to humans so you can imagine it's like an image of a bernie's mountain dog and the machine has to figure out that the label should be bernie's mountain dog okay and uh humans are right in this competition most people can be 95 percent accurate not 100 because how many breeds of dog do you really know uh but 90 95 percent right um and the machines uh at the time as of 2011 2010 were right, you know, depending on the model, between 50 and 70 percent of the time. They really weren't very good. Certainly not good enough to be useful. And 2012 came along, and Hinton and his team didn't just win; that they blew the competition away. They won by so much, and it was such a sort of noticeable change in our ability to uh, predict um, a label for an image that by the next year, all of the leading uh, teams were using a version of Hinton's algorithm. And the rest of the world started to notice the innovations that were happening here at the University of Toronto. And over the next five years, the future leads of AI research at, Meta, at Facebook, it's called Facebook at the time, at Apple and at OpenAI, uh, years of this, say 20 years ago, they were here at the University of Toronto. Hinton and one of those people, Jan LeCun, would go on to win uh, the Turing Award, kind of the Nobel Prize in Computer Science, and it was clear that exciting things were happening in the computer science department at the University of Toronto. Now, my co-authors and I, Ajay Joshua and I, we, we sit in the business school. And um, you know, normally, as business school professors at the University of Toronto, we'd maybe open an email, like the bullet, and it would say, oh, you know, look, there's, there's cool stuff happening in CompSci. Uh, Jan LeCun went on to lead AI research at Facebook. They won the Turing Award. Isn't that fantastic? And I'd open the email, I'd read it, I'd smile, I'd be proud to be at the University of Toronto, and then um, I'd completely forget about it and go back to my normal work. What's different about us is we run this organization called the Creative Destruction Lab. And the Creative Destruction Lab is a program that helps science-based startups scale. We started it way back in 2012. Yes, in that very first year where Hinton, one of Hinton's students, a team of his students won that uh, ImageNet competition, another one of his students was trying to build an AI startup to help molecules for drugs to cure disease. When we saw that company, it just seemed crazy, but the underlying idea seemed to work. We thought it was a one-off. The next year, we had a couple of more of these AI companies, mostly out of Hinton's lab, uh, that were doing AI for different applications. And then by 2015, we had so many applicants to our lab that were doing um, AI-related technologies technologies that we doubled the size of the lab and had a whole cohort dedicated to AI. To our knowledge, the first such cohort and accelerator anywhere in the world. At that point, 
it was clear that this was worth getting our heads around. Jay and I and Joshua Gans, the three of us who essentially made our careers studying how the internet impacted the economy, decided to change the direction of our research and start understanding this new technology. That led to initially our first book, Prediction Machines, and more recently, Power and Prediction. The core underlying ideas, though, go back to our original work studying the internet. So this is this is a uh, business history group. So in business history, 1995 might not be that old, okay? You guys remember 1995. Uh, you know, when I teach, even my MBAs now don't remember 1995, never mind the undergrads, okay? But 1995, as a reminder, was a very exciting year in technology. It was the year that um, Bill Gates wrote his internet tidal wave email that said um, it, the internet is a fundamental technology and Microsoft from now on is gonna be dedicated to commercializing it. It was the year that Netscape had their IPO and they're valued at over a billion dollars without a nickel in profit. And it was also the year that the last aspects of the public internet, the NSF net were privatized. On, on, on the NSF net, in the early, for a long, long time, it was illegal to do anything commercial. It's the term, so it was a government entity. And if you tried to you know, post something and sell it on the internet, you would get scolded or worse, kicked off. By 1995, that public internet was gone. And we now had a fully uh, integrated network of networks under TCP IP. Now, the... Excitement around the technology after the Netscape IPO and other pro, and the hype in the big, you know, started to explode. And people, uh, you know, investors started to say things like, well, we don't need the old rules. We had, uh, you know, MBA students. I wasn't here at Rotman, I was at Northwestern, and they were saying things like, we can throw out our economics textbook. This is a whole new world. It's a whole new economy. Now, you know, when I was doing economics PhD, I didn't like the idea of a whole new economy. Okay. And more generally, there was, uh, you know, a group led by Hal Varian, who was on the side, was the you know, dominant textbook writer of the 1980s, who said, wait, don't throw away our textbooks. It turns out that economics has a lot to say for us to understand technological change. And what he and Carl, Barry, uh, Carl Shapiro wrote in a book called Information Rules was that to understand the impact of the internet, you just need to understand what's cheap. Once you understand that um, search is cheap, that communication is cheap, and that copying is cheap, you can map out the consequences because Econ 101 in those textbooks is when something gets cheap, you do it more. Demand curve slope downward. And so as copying gets cheap, one of the implications was obvious, which was uh, copyright's going to be a much bigger deal because people are going to start sharing files. One of them might have been less obvious, but once you thought deeply about it, it was clear, which is that once anything you say to anyone can be instantly broadcast around the world for free, you're going to be more careful about what you say. Cheap copying has a direct line to caring about privacy. Once you understand what's cheap, you can start thinking deeply about what consequences look like. Varian went on from being the dominant textbook writer of the 1980s and early 90s to being the chief economist at Google and doing very well in that dimension as well. Okay. Um, that's the that's the, the internet. Let's go back a technology generation and think about the computer. Think about the semiconductor. What does your computer really do? It feels like a computer does all sorts of things, right? But it really only does one thing. It does it really, really, really well. Your computer does arithmetic. It does, that's it. It adds. But it turns out that arithmetic. Uh, once operating uh, at a high enough scale, once arithmetic gets cheap enough, we start to use arithmetic all over the place. Somewhere around 1960, the cost of arithmetic fell dramatically. And it continued for decades to fall dramatically. What that meant 
in the early days is we started to use machine arithmetic for good old-fashioned arithmetic. We used to have problems, and now we had machines. For example, in World War II and shortly after, we had cannons, and they shot cannonballs. It's a really difficult arithmetic problem to figure out where those cannonballs are going to land. And so we had these teams of humans whose job was called computer to figure out where those cannonballs were going to land. The, if you saw the movie Hidden Figures, this was a movie about these teams of humans whose job was called computer. Uh, but then machine arithmetic came along, and we no longer had humans calculating those trajectories, the artillery tables. They were replaced with machines. Um, then the machines came for the accountants. Okay? If you ask an accountant from the 1940s and 50s, and even in into the 70s, what they spent their time doing, they spent their time adding, literally adding up columns of numbers. Um, a homework problem that my accounting colleagues remember their professors giving to them uh, was uh, the pages to say page 962. Look at that col the column of seven digit numbers and add them up. Why did that happen? Well, you guys may or may not remember, but partly that's because professors are like that. But the students put up with it. Why did the students put up with it? Because that's what they knew they would be spending the rest of their lives doing. They would be spending their lives adding up columns of numbers. And so uh, when arithmetic got cheap enough, we started to use machine arithmetic to replace those humans in Noticeably and importantly, there are still plenty of bookkeepers and accountants because once the machines start helping you with the spreadsheets, there were still plenty of opportunities for bookkeepers and accountants to help with uh, company strategy and tax policy. But then as arithmetic got even cheaper, we realized that some things we never thought of as arithmetic problems can be solved engineering-wise with arithmetic, games and mail and music and pictures can be solved with arithmetic. Kodak, Kodak was a chemical company. It was a chemical engineering company. But as machines got cheaper, we could solve chemical engineering. We, sorry, we could solve uh, pictures, photography, with machine arithmetic. So that gets us to today's technology. This is a representation of convolutional, convolutional neural net. This is one of the core technologies underlying the current excitement in AI. And we should think about this as a drop in the cost of prediction. It is not what you see in science fiction. When we, you hear today's AI, if you read the press and believe it, you might think we are on the verge of, of maybe Star Wars or the Jetsons, where we're going to have all these machines that can provide all kinds of services that we asked for. Or we're on the verge of the Matrix or where the machine take over the world and destroy us all. That may or may not happen. Um, I'm actually glad that there are people in our psychology department, or sorry, our philosophy department, political science and elsewhere, thinking deeply about what this might mean. But this is not the technology we have today. And it is not when you think about the business applications of artificial intelligence over the next few years. You don't need to worry about uh, machines that are going to take over the world. You need to think about prediction. In the statistical sense, using information, you have to generate information. What's happening is predicting gotten better, faster, and cheaper. Now, uh, we toyed around with the idea of calling our book The Simple Economics of Computational Statistics, but our publisher would have none of that. And we, we settled on the more common term of artificial intelligence. But that's what we're talking about. It's just computational stats. Uh, the stats that you may have learned way back in undergrad, regression tools, but done much, much, much better. And so just like with arithmetic, we found all sorts of new applications for machine. Maybe the oldest business prediction is whether, is whether someone's gonna pay back their loan. And increasingly, we're using machine learning tools to predict whether someone's gonna default or pay back their loan. Or the insurance industry, they're, they're in the business of pricing risk. They're in the business of prediction. And increasingly, they're using machine learning tools to predict whether you're going to pay back, whether you're going to make a claim, and how big that claim is going to be. But just like with arithmetic, as prediction is getting cheaper, 
starting to realize sorts of applications of machine arithmetic that we didn't used to think of as arithmetic problems. Turns out Metis, how does your doctor diagnose you? They take in data about your symptoms and they fill in the missing information of the cause of that, those symptoms. That's prediction. Image recognition is prediction. How does Google know that there's so many cats on YouTube? Because there are some images of cats with labels where Google knows those are cats. And it uses those to predict which other images on YouTube have this same kind of shape to suggest they're a cat. It's prediction. The generative models that have taken the world by storm here or so are all prediction. ChatGPT is predicting the set of words, they call tokens, that is the best response to a particular query. DALI and the other image generation tools are predicting what image you're looking for <laughs> given your prompt. If you ask DALI for an astronaut on a horse in the style of Andy Warhol, it will give you an astronaut on a horse in the style of Andy Warhol. It is not a search engine. It's not that there is in the data astronauts. There are images of people on horses and there are images of the style of Andy Warhol and it is predicting the combination of the way to use that data to fill in the missing information about what belongs in, an, in that image. So as the hype is growing, Andrew Ng's comment that AI is a new electricity from five years ago has found um, a reemergence as, wow, electricity in the way we As a new electricity, it could transform the way industries operate. And one version of this, yeah, they're pretty good now, but imagine they get better and better and better to a point where you can do something differently. Like Amazon has their predictions about what you're going to buy. Their predictions are pretty good. They're right something like one out of every 20 times. They have hundreds of millions of items in their catalog, and they guess what you're going to want 5% of the time. That's an extraordinary feat of technology. And by being a little bit more right and getting what for Amazon. Amazon's consumer facing business is very similar to where it was 20 years ago. 20 years ago, you would go onto Amazon and they'd recommend something to you. They'd recommend you the Da Vinci Code, every one of you. It was their most popular item. So you would all get the Da Vinci Code, and then you'd choose whether to buy the Da Vinci Code or go into their catalog. You'd choose something from their catalog, they'd ship that to their warehouse, send that information to the warehouse, they Instead of the Da Vinci Code, you get a personalized recommendation. You decide whether to listen or buy something else. They send that information to the warehouse, they ship it to your door. But imagine that instead of 5% accurate, they were right 20% of the time, or 40% of the time, or 80% of the time, turning up that dial on the quality of their predictions. At some point, their predictions are going to be so good that they're not going to wait for you to order. At some point, they'll just ship it to your door. It's not a world of you shop and then they ship it to you. It's a world of they ship it to you and then you shop. And if you don't like some things, it, they're getting such a big share of your wallet that they'll build an infrastructure for returns. Now, Amazon hasn't done this, but they have thought about it. Here's a patent from Amazon for anticipatory package shipping. This is on their radar. But if you look carefully at the patent, something is very wrong. This is a patent from a decade ago. This has been on their radar for a long, long time, and it hasn't happened. More generally, of the companies that have spent money on AI, an overwhelming majority are unhappy with their investments and haven't seen the payoff yet. And that's, and most companies haven't even bothered in the first place. What does that mean if AI is the new electricity? If AI is gonna change the way we live and work, why isn't anybody satisfied with their investments in AI so far? Or why are so few, I shouldn't say anybody. Why are so few satisfied? Well, this patent was in 1880. 
Tesla's patent, right? It's the patent for the light bulb, I should say, is 1880. Tesla's patent for the alternating current electric motor, 1890. Yes, electricity changed the way we lived and worked. But, and that was clear, by the way, in the 1880s. But it wasn't until the 1920s that half of American households and factories were electrified. It took 40 years, more than a generation from people recognizing the potential of the technology until it actually made a difference for most people at home and at work. What took so long was a need for transformation of how the business... This is what a factory might have looked like in the 1880s. You can see there's a steam engine in the center of the factory, and um, you have these huge uh, wooden pillars holding up these steel, uh, you know, holding up these beams of steel uh, that are these shafts, sorry, these steel shafts that are uh, driving these pulleys and through belts that power all the other machines. Every single machine in the factory had to be connected to the power source. This is, by the way, based on the work of Warren Devine Jr. Um, and then later interpreted by Paul Davin. And um, what was true of the late 19th century factory is the geography, the microgeography of the factory, the construction of the factory was determined the power needs of the machines. So you had your most power hungry machines as close as possible to the steam engine because energy dissipates with distance. You had these big wooden pillars to hold up the shafts because um, these steel shafts were heavy. And then there was all this friction that was lost through those shafts. That, um, the factory itself was determined by its power needs. And so what happened when electricity came along is a handful of enterprising factory owners said, you know, we can save some money. We can reduce those frictions maybe. Um, and electricity where we are happens to be cheap relative to uh, steam power. So let's take out the steam engine, drop in electric motor at the exact same point, but leave the rest of the factory the same. And they did that. And they saved some 5, 10, or even 15% of the energy costs. But for the most part, it wasn't worth it. It wasn't worth it to take out the steam engine, drop in the electric motor, figure out how to get electricity distributed into the factory, figure out how to wire up the factory, figure out how to teach your factory workers not to touch the wires and how to keep it fire safe. All those things had to happen to save a little bit on energy costs. It just wasn't worth it. And so this first wave of point solutions where you kept the workflow the same led to very, very low adoption. So by 1900, less than 5% of factories had adopted in the US. But then people started to realize that electricity, it wasn't just cheap power. Electricity is distributed power. It allowed you to decouple the power source from the machine. And if you get power source, do things differently. And that led to a reorganization of the factory and what you might think of as the quintessential 20th century factory by Henry Ford and others. Starting around 1900, the trajectory of adoption changed because they weren't just doing the same thing, but a little bit cheaper. They realized they could create a different kind of factory with inputs in one end and outputs out the other, modular production single story, lightweight. You don't need those huge wooden pillars. You don't need beams. All of that was gone. The logic of production was determined not by the power needs of the machines, but by the logic of production. And that led to massive productivity improvements and over time, rapid adoption of AI in factories. And similar things were going on with the design of buildings to take advantage of electric light and appliances and other things. With AI, we're in the 1890s. We can see the potential of the technology, but we haven't figured out what the organism looks like. Almost all of the applications we've seen so far are point solutions, where you take out an existing process, you drop in the AI, but you keep the workflow the same. And the upside is therefore necessarily limited. When we think about, and that, that's what explains why so many companies haven't seen the payoff, even among those who haven't been ambitious in looking for a big payoff, 
They've been going for easy wins. And easy wins are wonderful because they happen, but they tend to not really be wins. When manager wins, it's called them doing their job. It's not called them figuring out a transformation of how the company might work, the industry might work. And so when we think about the opportunities and the challenges in AI, the, the underlying ideas in the rest of our book, um, Power and Prediction, is dedicated to thinking through how do we move from sort of that organization of the past through the between times to understand this organization of the future. Uh, thank you very much. We have lots of time for questions. Thank you, Professor Avi, for connecting the dots uh, so well and, and saying that we are in the 1890s or the early early part of the 19th century, 20th century in AI. So a lot of potential, but the, well, the way things are changing within a year, because I remember in September 2022, economists said that there will be a time when AI will help us to complete our sentences, but now it is helping us a lot more. <laughs> so within just within a year. So I, I think the pace of uh, change has been uh, drastic. So uh, I'll open the floor for uh, questions. Uh, I see... Uh, a lot of participants have joined in. I see Howard is raising his hand. Howard, go ahead. Thanks very much, Savvy. Th thanks, Avi. That was very, very interesting. Um, I just want to discuss, well, it's a few things, so it's not immediately a direct question, but it's under the umbrella about the concern uh, many people have about the impact of AI and the unknowns about the uh, impact of AI. and Sometimes I get a little bit worried about the electricity example being too neat and tidy. Uh, it's very elegant, but um, I'm worried that uh, we can't really even imagine what the potential impacts of this are, things that we haven't even thought about. And, and for instance, I, going back to your comment about 1995 and the ability to uh, broadcast a little bit later, but soon the ability to broadcast instantly around the world that all of us have, that we would be more cautious about what we say. I would argue that actually the opposite has taken place. Uh, people are much less cautious about what they say, and, and, and discourse has deteriorated and become much more toxic, which, which may not have been what was predicted. So um, I wondered if you could talk a bit about that. And now that we're in a, 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 a very um, a dangerous time in the world, uh, there are war scenarios people are talking about, uh, and, and it feels altogether quite scary, while it's also exciting from a technological point of view. OK, um, a great set of questions. Trying to figure out which which pieces to focus on. Um, so, uh, with the benefit of history, um, you know, we saw how electricity played out, and now it just seems wonderful. Okay, but it's important to remember that a lot went wrong. Okay, a lot died. Okay, it was it was not a safe technology. We had to figure that out. Um, a lot of people died from electrocution. Wires came down and caused fires, forest fires. Like it was, there was all there were all sorts of disasters um, that we now, with a hundred years of learning or more, uh, know how to deal with. Um, but not totally. Even the energy side of things, um, it was mostly the internal combustion engine that's caused the greenhouse problems. But um, you know, electrification hasn't been so great for it either. Use a lot more energy. And so the the point that technology has all sorts of unintended consequences, um, I'm all in for. And I actually think uh, I appreciate that point. I think electricity demonstrates some of them. You could do the same with computing. You could do the same with um, uh, mass production of um, tools, which weapons was uh, core to what happened to the US Civil War and World War One. Like there's all sorts of negative, you know, uh, like you know, technologies are tools and tools can be used for all sorts of things. And I 100% agree with that. Um, the uh, the more, more generally, when you hear worries about 
um, I think there's three core worries that are very prominent in the press with respect to AI. Okay. Uh, you may have been sort of top of mind lately. Highlight signed by uh, a whole bunch of leading computer scientists and others uh, last March. So uh, worry number one is uh, that the machines will take over the world fundamentally. You know, should we create machines that are smarter than us? Okay. Um, there's implied two bad things about machines that are smarter than us. The first one is we no longer control our society. Okay, that's fair, but I, I don't really know that we do right now, but that's another, you know, that's a side point, but that's for a political scientist and not for an economist. Um, and I guess there's a agency over the future that, you know, a, a power dynamic that makes people worry. Now, those are important things to think about. Our basic economic models strength and a weakness and the strength and weakness is they um uh, they communicate clearly what we value and power isn't directly in most of our models so as long as we get what we want as long as we live long ha happy healthy lives it doesn't matter there our models don't have a good way to think about agency like, okay, if a machine's providing with us with long, happy, healthy, good lives, as opposed to some other human who's in government providing us with long, happy, healthy lives, econ, our standard econ models say, is, say, who cares? Okay. And in fact, machines that outsmart us sound awesome from a basic economic point of view, because there's going to be innovation, and that presumably is going to lead to better healthcare, uh, better ability to deal with the most pressing problems of our times, like climate change, um, is that we and brains haven't been able to figure out. So now, that's all, you know, Econ 101 on like the power side of things is incredibly optimistic, but it's incredibly optimistic because Econ 101 doesn't care about power. Okay. Um, Concern number two is misinformation. Okay, and that is very, very clear right now that misinformation is an issue. Uh, how do we know what we're going to trust? Misinformation um, is a real and important short-term problem. Now, you don't care about problems. All those electrical fires in the 1880s and 1890s and early 20th century, it's not like, yeah, who cares about all those people? Because you know, by you know, by not by 2023, we figured it all out. Um, but they are short-term problems. What I mean by that is it can't be an equilibrium that we're fooled all the time. Okay. Um, so the equilibrium is going to be that we to verify. So in the long run, that's fine. The long run might be a few years, and it could be a very messy few years. So that's not a totally obvious. And if there's a revolution in the short run, we don't care about the long run, right? Um, so, but there's that's the you know the the economics of misinformation. It is a short and a long term problem. The third high level worry that I see often in well that was in that letter that petition uh, is jobs. Should we create machines that are jobs? Now, the business history seminar. So you guys know eliminating all jobs is really hard. In fact, even eliminating one job is really hard. The automatic telephone switch was invented in 1890. Do you guys know when the last telephone switch operator was fired? 1978. Okay. It took almost 90 years to fully automate that job. Um, because automate, it's easy to automate certain tasks within a workflow, and it's easy easy to change processes, but to fully get rid of a job is hard. And even in the 1950s, there were still lots and lots of telephone operators. Um, so, but more generally, as long as there is some part of the economy that, has, uh, that hasn't had a massive boost in productivity, that economy is going to become more and more important. It's this idea that's called Baumel's cost disease after William Baumel, who, you know, and his models of it. And as agriculture became more productive, that was wonderful for everybody, but agriculture became less important in terms of the workforce and in terms of overall GDP. 
then manufacturing got more productive. That meant we got more manufactured stuff. That was great for, uh, you know, uh, for the people within a country, but it was less of employment and less of GDP. Certain services are starting to get more efficient and those services are becoming less uh, important to the economy and others where we haven't had these productivity improvements, healthcare, edu uh, healthcare education, elsewhere, they become more and more important. So the all jobs probably isn't the right question. The worry is more... Um, if we have this technology, who's going to get the spoil? Is to be are is the are the benefits going to be distributed equally or not so equally? And there's reasons to worry um, about an increase in inequality. Uh, broadly, if you look at what happened with computing and the internet, um, there are two categories of reasons to worry. With both computing and the internet, uh, their capital. And uh, the owners of capital um, got wealthier and wealthier, while uh, labor did not. And so the capital labor share, um, you know, we got had a lower labor share for the economy, bigger capital, and that led to concentration of of power, okay, and wealth. There's no reason at all to think AI is going to be different, because that it's a very competitive landscape, and so the rents to capital get dissipated. Um, but the other reason is a little bit different. So Claudia Gold and Claudia, who won the Nobel Prize, uh, and, and Larry Katz have this book called The Race Between Education and Technology. And they document what happened over the 20th century in workers' wages. And essentially, it's um, in the first half of the 20th century, yes, uh, working required more skills and more education, but so many more people were getting educated that overall inequality fell, All right? So it's this race between education and technology, you know, supply of skilled labor and demand for skilled labor. And since supply of skilled labor went up so quick in the 20th century, we saw a compression. Around 1970, that started to reverse where demand for skilled labor started outpacing supply. And um, and then we started to see increased inequality with computers and the internet. Um, if the future is like the past, AI is going to be the same. Uh, we have a paper that uh, came out over the summer in Science Magazine called Do We Want Less Automation? Where we argue that um, if you think of what it does, often what it's doing is automating the jobs of the most skilled workers. Think about in healthcare, diagnosis is what gets doctors their uh, outsized wages. Yeah, they do other things too. They help people navigate the stress of the healthcare system and stuff like that. But that's that's fundamentally like nurses probably do that better, or social workers probably do that better. Doctors have to spend all that time in school because they need to learn the body in order to diagnose. Well, if a machine's doing diagnosis, that should equalize the healthcare system. Empower nurses, pharmacists, and other medical professionals uh, make them more productive to be more like doctors. And we can do that industry by industry. So, okay, that was a long answer, Howard. I realized that. Um, you know, that's, I actually have like an hour and a half talk prepared on that subject, but, you know, um, but the, the broad takeaway is, you know, on losing control of society, I don't even know what that means, but, you know, on the economics of it, it's, it's, uh, Optimistic. Misinformation is a real problem, but it's short term. And jobs isn't so much the problem at inequality. Other questions? Um, thank you, Professor Abby. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, just a, sorry, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Just a question on uh, you mentioned that lots of the corporations that are implementing AI aren't seeing satisfactory results and it's because they're just dropping it in rather than uh, revamping entire processes and rethinking how the business works. Yeah. Um, what technologies, maybe a two-part question, one, what technologies are 
uh, also sort of coming up to speed to help those process shifts. So things like vector databases or, or any other tools that might be useful. Yeah. And then two, uh, uh, in terms of actual process shifts, like could you give some type of example of, of what that looks like when, when implemented correctly? Sure. Um, so there is a, I mean, AI is, you can think about this you know, uh, as a catalyst technology, and it's a complement to a whole bunch of other things like uh, rich data sets and um, um, you know, rich data, uh, software engineering to implement things, uh, um, uh, some, some abilities on the data science side and the machine learning side. Cloud is typically uh, a key input to being able to have system uh, security, uh, making sure your uh, um, your cybersecurity processes are are efficient and in place. There's a whole bunch of these other things that are that are necessary for sure. Yep. Examples. Um, so examples of successful uh, um, redesign of a business um, to where we've already seen a system solution. Are pretty rare because of AI because we're really right at the beginning. Um, and the two best examples we have are both industry. It was uh, for the most part a new entrant that took it over. So those two examples are in personal transportation and in advertising. Personal transportation. Um, you think about a navigational prediction. You know how do you get from point A to point B? Um, as Garmin GPS devices and then the iPhone came out, um, those were fundamentally used by professional drivers, like taxi drivers, to help them find rides and get more efficiently from point A to point B. That's a point solution. Doing what you always did, but in 20 minutes, it takes you 18 because you have a better prediction about the where the traffic is. Um, that same technology enabled every single amateur driver to be just about as good as a professional. And so we went from having hundreds of thousands of taxi drivers in the US to having millions of Uber drivers and Lyft drivers. Like that's that's a system level change that's enabled by prediction technology. The other one is the advertising industry. It's a little trickier to get into the details. So you have to know some of the, the you know, how that works, but advertising used to very much be a, a industry based on charm. And, uh, you know, if you've seen Mad Men, that's kind of how it worked. Not, not on the drama side, but at least on the, the selling side. And Google and Facebook um, and some others totally changed that industry because you had good predictions about who wanted what and when. You know. Yeah. Oh, I lost you. Hello. 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 Can you hear me? Hello. Yes. Hello. Ah, great. Thank you so much. And uh, Sanjeev, it's great to see you. Uh, Sanjeev and I worked together uh, some, oh. some time back, so uh, yes. that was a good surprise. <laughs> AI brings us together. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. So, uh, Pro Professor Avi, thank you so much for sharing your insights. Uh, it was a really interesting talk. I'm curious, um, what are some areas that you think are impactful and are impactful in terms of applied AI, uh, yet are perhaps underserved today. People are either not thinking about it, maybe it's not as mainstream sexy, but based on your observation, you feel there may be some really good opportunities that are impactful, not just for companies, but impactful overall. I was curious if there's anything like that that comes to mind. Like examples of AI that are impactful? What do you, okay, so underserved, I guess. Oh, to underserved communities. Okay. Um, so, oh, um, so remember there was a lead water crisis in Flint, Michigan? Mm -hmm. Do you remember this That's about right. five years ago? Okay. Um, so these two professors at the University of Michigan, uh, Eric Schwartz, who's a marketing professor like me, and a guy named Jacob Abernethy, uh, developed an AI a tool, a machine learning tool to predict which pipes had lead, okay? Uh, there was a water crisis in Flint, Michigan, sure. They knew that 20% of the houses had lead pipes and they had no idea which 20%. 
there were no records of where the lead pipes were. So some of them were lead, some of them were copper. And back when they were laying the pipes, no one, it just didn't seem to matter. And so no one kept track of which pipes were which. Um, Eric and Jacob developed an algorithm to predict, to use machine learning tools to predict which ones were lead and which ones were copper. The reason that mattered is the only, if you wanted to figure out uh, if your lead pipes were lead or copper, you actually had to dig. That was expensive and slow. And so the city was going sort of street by street, house by house, digging up a pipe, literally looking at it. And if it was lead, they'd replace it right there. And if not, they just put the dirt back. And that cost thousands of dollars and lots and lots of time. Uh, Eric and Jacob's algorithm was, uh, um, you know, instead of 20% accurate, it was 80% accurate, right? Huge impact. It was wonderful. And so hundreds of people at the start in Flint, Michigan, got safe drinking water because the city started listening to their algorithm. But then um, some people weren't happy. There were people in Flint who, I think, you know, 80% accurate isn't 100% accurate. And some of them were noticing that down the street, their neighbors were getting their pipes dug up. And they weren't getting their pipes dug up. Or people in the next ward over were getting their pipes dug up, but people in their ward weren't getting their pipes dug up. And they said, well, hey, city councilor, this isn't fair. Why are we listening to these eggheads at the University of Michigan? That's not the right thing to do. We should go street by street, house by house, systematically in Flint, starting with your ward and starting with my house. And, and um, you know, as depressing as it is, the, the city councilors agreed. You know, who knows exactly why? And they stopped using uh, Blue Conduit's algorithm and they started going back to just a systematic based on political preferences or some other preferences, hard to say, uh, which houses got dug up first. And the success rate was 80% to 20. And thousands of people who should have been drinking safe water were not because the city changed their, their habits. This was like an AI success story gone wrong. But because it was an AI and because it was so easy to measure, because the solution was so clear, People from the city sued the government and said, no, no, you, we, we know what works. Go back to using those AIs. And the government, uh, a judge actually sided with the plaintiffs, and it became the law in Flint, Michigan, to listen to this algorithm. And then because of the success they had in Flint, around the U.S. and now around the world in dozens and dozens of cities, they're using their tool to find lead pipes and save thousands and thousands of people from drinking uh, toxic water. So it's a huge, like that's, that's one of my favorite examples, partly because like I know, the, I know the folks in it, but partly because um, a clear example of how AI and public health can transform, um, you know, can really improve lives. Awesome. Thank you. We have time for one more, if there is one. And if not. Good. One more. Thank you very much for the presentation. Just uh, maybe a bit more of a downer question. I, I hear what you're saying about rents to capital being dissipated over time due to competition. But in the discussion of Amazon being able to ship products in anticipation, there seems to be some pretty significant net network effects that play into that in terms of the share of wallet initially required and then cemented with that ecosystem. So corporations that have that first mover advantage are gonna have way more data to inform their predictions and I think be very hard to disrupt once they're established. So what's the counterweight to that? Um, the counter, I guess the core counterweight to that is it's a dynamic industry and uh, um, a series of short-term monopolies from different companies uh, can still generate plenty of benefits to consumers so that we don't get this concentration of capital. But, and I should be clear, I serve as an expert witness on uh, against big tech companies on plenty of cases. Um, and the key challenge is exactly what you're described is a piece of what you're describing, which is to me, the challenge isn't so much, you know, if the company invests in making their AI so good that they can predict what you're going to want and ship it to you and provide amazing services, that's wonderful. As long as they don't use that 
to then advantage the next generation of products that may take advantage of AI or some other tool uh, to uh, to generate benefits. So Amazon has done fantastically in cloud with AWS. Yes. Um, that's been amazing. And they and sometimes they took a bet early and they're getting some well-deserved rents, um, I think, for that bet. But if they, and I, if, I don't think they are yet, uh, if they start using their advantage in cloud to favor certain AI products, particularly their AI products, um, that in turn allows them to dominate a next generation of technology, then that's an unfair advantage. And that's where we're going to see lower quality products, out, you know, particularly outsized rents, because uh, they're, they're not investing, they're not really investing in the technology, they're self-referencing, that will lead to real problems. So that's like a longer discussion about the, the economics of antitrust in, in the tech industry. Uh, but I, I agree with you. The, like I'm, as I said, I'm optimistic on the um, skilled versus unskilled labor side of things. I'm much less optimistic on the capital labor share side of inequality. Thank you very much. Appreciate the talk. Uh, no problem. Thank you. And uh, I think we are out of time. So thanks, everybody. It was, I hope you, you enjoyed. Keep in touch uh, know, through LinkedIn or wherever. And Thank take you. Care. Bye. Thank you, Professor Avi. And you can find Professor Avi on LinkedIn and on Rotman website. So.